by 11.44, 11.45 a.m., I'm on the city's southwest side in Englewood neighborhood for the very first time in my life. Mitch, my husband of 24 years, and now my caretaker and housekeeper <laughs> and personal driver, he drives us 131 blocks south on Western Avenue across our segregated city from our single family 1920s Chicago fire brick bungalow in Westridge, Little India to Holy Cross Hospital, where I uneventfully get my first Pfizer shot. Now, if you Google Englewood, the first thing that pops up after the Wikipedia definition is people ask, how dangerous is Englewood? In an outdated 2013 WGN local news investigative report, colors my vision with anti-Black rhetoric. Englewood consistently ranks as one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the city. And for those who don't live there and are unlikely to ever visit, WGN offers you a glimpse of the life on the streets. In just 12 hours, you witnessed more trouble than most will see in their lifetime. Code, danger equals black. Now, Chicago's common fire bricks line the sides and backs of buildings and holding front facades so that on the surface, the area around the hospital doesn't look too different from where we live in Westridge. It looks safe. Space is raced. I'll be corrected later on by a lifelong Southside friend that Holy Cross is in a Lithuanian pocket that is technically not Englewood, but Marquette Park. Code safe equals white, but safe for whom? April 6, 2021, 11 a.m. My backup driver, Larry Lee, takes me to my second appointment at Holy Cross at 11 a.m. So Larry is one of my Asian American artist friends. He's also been a surrogate older brother and backyard barbecue pal for the last 30 years since I moved to Chicago at age 18 to go to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Can we stop to eat lunch before we go home? I ask at 11.20 as we drive east back towards Lake Michigan, away from the infamous Englewood. Larry is Chinese American, born in the South Side, in a South Side Chinatown restaurant family and raised in South Carolina. And he always knows the best place spots to eat at. Oh, there's some places two Asians don't go, Larry replies. We can always head back up to our neck of the woods for something to eat. How about Bami? Do me a favor, call Sunny, see what she wants. Sunny is Larry's third wife and my favorite. <laughs> She's from South Korea. But most of the time, Sunny and I just text each other back and forth about K-drama suggestions. She wants barbecue pork too. My light skinned face and bald head reflect back in the passenger side car mirror. Do I look Asian today, I wonder? Chicago has Chinatowns. There's the OG one on the south side on Cermak and Wentworth. Well, technically that's the first one. And then there's the one on the north side called in Uptown called New Chinatown. But it's actually, it's largely like Southeast Asian and everyone I know calls it Argyle after the Argyle L station on Main Street. So back in 1949, Mitch's grandpa Oscar Aronson and their family, they left Chicago's west side and they opened Delicious Bakery. It was a Jewish bakery on Argyle and they sold bagels and bialis and they had that business until 1966. So my friends and I go to the same exact location today to meet up after art openings, to eat Peking duck, but now it's Sunwa barbecue. I start to doze off in the car as we wind our way on north on Lakeshore Drive, soon to be DuSable Drive, <laughs> past Soldier Field, past the spot of the toppled Christopher Columbus statue in Grant Park. The base of the statue is wrapped in plastic and looks reminiscent of a phallic crystal installation. I was lying wrapped in bed sheets, recovering from a lumpectomy back in July 2020, when activists were demanding that the city remove this symbol of white supremacy and Chicago's streets were filled with unrest, demanding that black lives matter. Anger fueled awake in the wake of video captured cops and vigilantes committing murder. Anger fueled awake, demanding justice for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, Tony McDade, and so many more. Anger fueled awake, to quote my critical ethnic studies graduate students, black lives lost to the inequality of this country, taken by COVID and abandoned by the state. I'd only seen the removed Columbus statue on the news, and it was when I was half asleep, but here, Passing by the car window was the remnant of the fucker wrapped in plastic like a partially erect condom. 
being mixed Asian and white and originally from the West Coast, I've long felt like I belong everywhere and nowhere, like a cute cosmopolitan chameleon nomad. But, you know, Chicago can be provincial. If you're not born here, you're not really from here. I was always passing through. But the Christopher condom reminds me that this land I've lived on for 30 years is not mine either. I'm also a settler and an uninvited guest, a fucker. My first white ancestors are rumored to have arrived on Turtle Island as French mercenary soldiers during the American Revolution. And my first Asian indigenous ancestors arrived four generations ago from Okinawa to the Hawaiian Islands in 1912 as part of a chain of settler colonial Japanese sugar plantation labor migration. My own occupied roots grew in Pope and Talbot logging soil, entangled with Bangor and Keyport naval bases on the shores of the Salish Sea, an unceded Coast Salish territory in the Pacific Northwest. But now, I am a settler stuck in traffic and hungry. 20 minutes go by and nothing moves. Why are the flags that soldier fill at half mast? Is it because of the 13 year old boy, Adam Toledo, who was shot by police on March 29th? Or maybe the Boulder King super mass shooting on March 22nd? Or maybe it was the eight victims of the Atlanta spa shooting on March 16th? Helicopters beat angrily overhead. Their wings remind me of the sound of the bases of the air in Okinawa. And I look up expecting to see a V-22 Osprey tilt rotator aircraft. But what I do see is a line of police running step in step through Brant Park towards the traffic area ahead of us. This can't simply be a traffic accident. Midori would tell me about the shooting later that night. She'd seen it on Chicago media takeout on Instagram. And five days later on Sunday, I would catch an official news report that a one-year-old boy had been shot in the head in an apparent road rage incident at 11 a.m. on North Brown Lakeshore Drive, just south of Soldier Field. The toddler's car would crash down the street near the Chicago Yacht Club, near the Maggie Daly Park, which he should be enjoying, right near Grant Park, the city's dividing line between North and South, between Black and White. The baby is Black, the shooter is Black, the news disappears, but the toddler his name is Caden Swan, and he's 22 months old. And on April 6, he was on a ventilator at Lurie Children's Hospital in critical condition with brain injury. His great grandpa, Clifton Marble, told the news, it looks like, it looks to be like he's gonna be okay. The bullet went in and came out. But we don't know this yet. We are just two Asians stuck in traffic. We are diverted onto Roosevelt Road and my fleeting attention span returns to my stomach. Where should we get banh mi? I want barbecue pork. So Nulan has the best bread in my opinion, but they are closed on Tuesdays. What about Bali? Oh, I wonder if they have avocado bubble tea though. Parking might be tough in front of Bali. So pre-pandemic, the city and local merchants transformed Little Saigon into Asia on Argyle with tourists ready red brick shared streetscape and summer Argyle night markets. Lotus seed doesn't have avocado bubble tea after all. I'll take the honeydew with boba. I'm dehydrated. I give myself a brain freeze sucking down the smoothie too quickly and while we wait for our sandwiches. I entertain myself with the sound of black tapioca balls traveling up my fat purple plastic straw popping off like little bullets onto the roof of my mouth. April 6. 2021, 11 p.m. I feel like a 7-Eleven hot dog that's been sitting under a heat lamp too long, just rolling back and forth and sweating. My bed sheets are soaked and twisted as fever tide rises and waves of chills wash over me. Familiar muscle, joint, and lower back body aches let me know I'm, my immune system is working. At least that's good. I've been through the valley of red devil chemo and the tortures of Taxol. So I think I can handle what feels like a typical bad flu. But then I begin to vomit, like projectile vomit. Me, who never got sick once all through chemo, thanks to Zofran, a very effective and expensive drug, 
anti-nausea medication. I'm now left gripping the bowl of my Toto Japanese toilet. So the toilet was a high-tech gift from my youngest brother from Oahu to remind me of my travels to Japan. On Wednesday, I have to call in sick. But being the superwoman, I think I am. I tell my husband, I'm okay, and insist he go to work. My colleague, Bibiana Suarez, takes over my beginning painting class, and I give my afternoon Asian American art students an online task. Midori, who is miserably attending online school in her downstairs basement, and in her room downstairs, tries to take care of me during our, her asynchronous breaks, but I keep vomiting. And of course I tell Midori, I'm fine, so she can leave for her after school water polo. I'm a home alone. I vomit a fountain of pink Pepto-Bismol into the Toto. It's my Asian American abstract expressionist rendition of a Duchamp's ready-made urinal. I should sign it like Armut, right? 2021. <sighs> I vomit over 17 times until 4 p.m. on Wednesday when my husband returns from work alarmed to finding me listless on the upstairs bathroom floor with our two Shiba Inus standing sentry like Okinawa and Shisa lions. The doctor is called and he tells me to go to the emergency room for an IV, but I, I don't want to go. Mitch remembers the Zofran, that powerful anti-nausea med left over from chemo, and thankfully these do the trick within 20 minutes. I sip Gatorade till Thursday morning when the symptoms subside. And then at 8 a.m., I return to radiation, followed by a full day of virtual conferencing at the Association for Asian American Studies and graduate advising for critical ethnic studies. My friends on social media give me conflicting comments. You're a warrior. Don't be a woman warrior. Just stay still. Just be. But I can't rest. Restless. On Friday morning after radiation, I follow the instructions on the back of my vaccine card and dutifully report my vaccine adverse event to the government. I heard vomiting only happens in less than 2% of cases. And who knows if they even tested this on cancer patients in active treatment. I wanna help. But as I'm about to submit the form, I stop to check my white privilege and wonder, will my medical and personal data be safe? Who can I trust? Will I be safe? Am I safe? Are you safe? I am not okay after all. I'm agitated, mad, and exhausted. I need to take up space. I need to feel alive. I need to figure things out through my feelings and in my body. I don't want to be alone. I need community. But what is my kuleana responsibility as a settler? Can I think beyond my body? Can I feel beyond my city? Can I see beyond islands? Can I dream beyond nation states and still be here?